Welcome to Crime Most French, a fortnightly podcast covering intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Researched and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open the van and let the mayhem commence. This is episode 65, the Rue Copernic bombing. On the 3rd of October 1980, a bomb explodes in front of the synagogue Rue Copernic, Rue Copernicus, in Paris. 43 years later, the affair family finally came to a close. This story was in the news last month, at the time of release, so for us it's just a few days ago, because the final trial in this case took place in France. So we thought it was uh, interesting to have a look at what, what happened. So it's straight hot off the presses, so to speak. The end of the story is hot off the press. The mm-hmm. rest of the story is 40 years ago. Mm. I don't even remember that one. On the 3rd of October 1980, the synagogue, Rue Copernic in Paris, which is in the 16th district, that's the poshest one, mm. is very busy. There's three bar mitzvah and two bat mitzvah happening at the same time. Mm, so there's f- f- five coming of ages uh, parties going on. Yeah, two boys and two, uh, three boys and two girls. Yes. So there are whole families in the church, children, parents, grandparents. Mm. In total, that's three hundred and twenty-three people in the temple. Wow! Uh, celebrating the. It's obviously uh, quite a big building. It doesn't look big from outside. Uh, there's f- there will be photos on the website. Mm-hmm. But it must be quite long, I guess, quite because deep. the front of the building is not big. I don't see how 300 people would fit in there, but it must be quite deep and mm. goes, I don't know, a long distance into the back, which you can't see from the road. Yeah, I guess it's a building that doesn't have a traditional structure, it's not like a house, so it's, it's always difficult to tell. Yeah, I don't know what it looks like inside. It, I, I know only one thing. Um, there's a glass warehouse-like ceiling. Uh-huh. To the the building, right? That's what I know. I okay. don't know what else is in there. So, at six thirty eight p.m., a bomb explodes just outside the building. Right. The glass ceiling falls onto people inside. Ooh, that would have been nasty. Yeah. Outside, one of the doors is blown up. Cars are thrown onto the pavement, and windows and shop fronts explode at one hundred and fifty meters. So it's obviously quite powerful. That was probably a big boom, yeah. yeah. Because to move cars, mm. and again, there will be photos on the website, cars are actually flipped and moved right. around, so that must have been a big thing, yeah. Quite a big shockwave. Yeah. Witnesses talk of a, a scene of war, mm. with bodies and cars and debris everywhere. People say that they don't remember anything like it since the OAS, OAS bombings during the Algerian War. Okay. So, a little bit of background. The OAS, which is Organisation de l'Armée Secrète, which is in English Secret Army Organization, was a French group, mostly military, but not only, with generals and high-ranking officers at its head, that organized a terrorism campaign in France and in Algeria in the early 60s to force the goal to keep Algeria as part of France, because at the, at the time it was part of France. It was mm. one of the departments. It, it was created in Madrid following a failed putsch attempt in Algeria in 1961 to get rid of the goal, and then failed. And the bombing has killed 2,200 people in Algeria and 71 in the metropole. Good Lord. So people compare it to that. Mm. During those bombings in the early 60s, de Gaulle is very famous for having said that he wasn't scared of a quartet of retired generals. <laughs> right. That was his style. Yes, typical of de, yeah. de Gaulle. So eventually they were all found out and the OAS was disbanded and all the leaders executed at dawn. Mm-hmm. For treason, obviously. Yes. It's kind of like almost uh, around about the 80s anyway that the IRA was still very, very active. It was the same, but on a larger scale. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because the IRA never killed 2,000 people. No. Whereas no, no. the OAS did, and yeah. it did that in less than two years. Yeah, that's So imagine insane. the number of bombings there were, yeah. like, every week or every month. Mm-hmm. So, yes, it was a big campaign of bombing yeah. happening. I there. mean, when I was a kid um, in the late 70s, um, I even I was aware of the fact that there was, like, Christmas campaigning of uh, bombing by, uh, in London by the IRA. It's mm-hmm. a violent time, violent time to be living in the UK. 
Anyway, back to Copernic. Four people are dead. Mm -hmm. 46 are injured. The dead ones are Philippe Busu, who was 22, and he was killed as he was riding his bike past the synagogue when it exploded. Oh, wrong place at the wrong time. Wrong place, wrong time. Bless. Ariza Chagrier, who was 42, she was an Israeli TV presenter on holiday in France. Oh, no. And she just happened to walk past in the street. Eek. Jean-Michel Barbet, who was the driver for one of the families, who was waiting next to the oh, car. Right. Oh, and he was blown up as well. Doing his, just doing his just job. Doing his job, yeah. yeah. And Hilario Lopez Fernandez, a Portuguese concierge at the Hotel Victor Hugo, which is nearly opposite the, okay. uh, the synagogue. Yeah, well, it's nothing between him and the, the blast. So. Yeah, so he was gravely injured and died two days later. Yeah. No. There is now a plaque on the building with the names on it. Mm. But could have been worse, because we're talking only four dead. Mm, yeah. Out of 323 people in the synagogue. Yeah, given that glass ceiling that you yes. talked about, it's quite surprising. Yeah. So the bomb was located on in the bags of a motorbike, which was a blue Suzuki TS-125. Right. I have no idea what that looks I like. Say, that means nothing to me. Yeah. No. Suzuki, I don't it think... It might do some people, but... Yeah, and I, I don't think... The Suzuki... I don't think they make kind of like the big powerful uh, motorbikes. No they? They're not I know nothing cheap about and cheerful, that stuff. aren't they? I don't know. Yeah. I should really... Well, that was a... Twin, I assume 125 was the, the engine power. size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 125cc, mm -hmm. so it's no. a fairly small one, I would assume. Not that you need a lot of power to move a bike, but yeah. No. Mm. No, it was probably more moped than a bike. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Anyway. Uh, it was parked about 10 meters from the, the temple. And it contained 10 kilos of explosive and a timing mechanism that was set to go off as people were supposed to come out of the synagogue. So, I mean, it certainly seemed to be targeted and not just some oh, kind it's of random, not random. Act. No, 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 no. It was definitely they wanted to kill people coming out of the synagogue. Yeah. Now, for the reason why they didn't kill so many people, because people weren't out, mm. I've seen two explanations and I don't know which one is right. One is that the mechanism was slow. Right. Oh, no, the mechanism was fast. Ah, right, okay. Yeah, so it went off early. too early. Yeah, it went off early and it was So that, was, that would be a, right. a mechanical problem. Mm. The other explanation I've read in the newspapers is that the rabbi, uh, Michael Will one Michael Williams, was about 15 minutes late on that day. Mm. And therefore, so the whole thing late. was 15 minutes late right. and it exploded 15 minutes before mm. people came out, even though that might have been the right time, but they were mm. just running late. So I don't know which one is true. But anyway, no, nobody was out of the synagogue when the bomb exploded, mm. which is lucky. That was also the first anti-Semitic terrorism action in France since World War II. Mm. So that, that was a big thing. I don't remember that happening at all. I remember some of the bombings in the early 80s, like for example, Rue des Rosiers is a famous one, which happened the next year, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but that was Palestinians. I remember a few during the 80s, and I remember certainly remember the 90s one because I was around, and I was even evacuated from a theater once because oh, wow. a bomb exploded next door. Oh, God. Uh, and once I was having a driving lesson, and we saw smoke coming up. It was in Paris. <laughs> Good luck. And that was one of the bombs exploding as well in the street. So I remember those, no problem. But that one, for some reason, I don't remember at all. I don't remember that story. Yeah, I mean, you get any big city and, you know, uh, certainly num probably outside, uh, not not in Scotland particularly, but London and big cities tend to bear the scars. Uh, and Paris in particular has had a lot of scars to bear with regards to bombings. Oh, in the, I don't know how many there's been, but between the, even 1980 and mm. 1996, seven, and there's been a lot mm. of bombs. And that was kind of cyclical, I guess. It was Palestinians first and Algerians, and then Algerians again in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, in the 90s, it was Algerians because the French government supported the elected government in Algeria, which was considered corrupt by people in Algeria, and who had cancelled the election winners, uh, which was the FIS, which was an, um, an Islamic party, right. who had won the elections, and generals took over and said, nah, not happening. And that's when the bombing started again in France because France supported that. Yeah, you can you can tell why uh, Algerians really aren't that open and friendly to to the French. No, that is very weird. When you go to Morocco, for example, mm. uh, the Moroccans are very friendly to the French. Yeah. Even though they were technically mm. under some control from France. Yes. 
but the Algerians are very, very hostile. Oh, yeah. um, I wouldn't go to no. on holiday. You wouldn't go down the south of Morocco uh, for, for, for going on holiday. I wouldn't go east of Morocco in Algeria. Yes. But strangely, right. Tunisia is also friendly. So uh, Algeria is like sandwich between right. Mor- Morocco and Tunisia. And they're both friendly, but Algeria not yeah. at all. That's just the way it is. It's, it's probably due to the history because Morocco, for example, wasn't technically um, annexed by France like mm. Algeria was. Morocco was kind of in a protectorate. Yeah. And kept independent yeah. until they said they wanted independence and they were given independence straight away. Yeah. So there was no fighting, there was nothing. Yeah. So the the split was kind of amicable, yeah, I you, guess. You, you've got the, the reaping of the benefits and uh, and the trampoline yes, kind of Yes, and none of the trauma of having a war to, yeah. to get independence. Whereas Algeria, nobody wanted to let no. them go. So. I mean, that was crazy in a bloody time. Yes. Uh, so that, that's a very different story and very different attitude now even still. Oh, yeah. Um, anyway, um, less than an hour after the bombing, uh, an anonymous, anonymous call to the AFP press agency mm-hmm. claims responsibility for a European far right group that had just been dissolved by the French government in Monsar area. <laughs> All right, okay. Immediately after, Michael Williams, the rabbi, declared on TV that the bomb had been planted by French neo Nazis and he and his followers were not afraid. So at that point, every, everything goes towards far, the far right and neo-Nazis, either European or French. Right. So that's where people are looking. It's, I mean, it's a sad, sad state of affairs that uh, these groups exist on the well, continent. Well, this one didn't exist anymore. <laughs> oh, yes. It had been disbanded yeah, and made no, illegal. But even if they've been, you know, disbanded by, by, you know, the government. These, I mean, it's just sad to think that on, on the continent that had so much horror uh, you know during world war 2 these groups still exist i mean it's just yeah. sad and depressing yeah during the next few days hundred, hundreds of thousands of people protest in the streets and demand action mm. mp's and other representatives for all parties pretty much from left to right also join well yeah i mean it's you'd be you'd look pretty bad if you didn't get yes. involved uh, the protests often attacked the right-wing government at the time in power, mm. and Jewish organizations called the government complicit of murders. Was this Chirac that was uh, in power? Mm, or was it no, still Mitterrand? No, 1980, that would have been VG. Ah, right, okay, yes. Um, in fact, that was in the autumn before the 1981 presidential election where Mitterrand, so the left, were elected mm-hmm. for the first time since... The war, I think. Right. You know, there had been no left government since the war. So, so that was just before that. That's that, not really that surprising. Yes. Given the... So anyway, they were blaming the right government. Mm. Right. Some Jewish groups take things further as well, and they start attacking known members of far-right, far-right groups. Mm. So, for example, several were beaten up in the street, which were the lucky ones. They only had like concussions usually, but yeah. uh, sometimes broken limbs. But that was too bad. It wasn't too bad. So uh, you're sending a message rather than actually robbing people out. I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of them was attacked in his house, and he was bound to a chair and injected with a mix of oil and estrogens. Holy shit! That's yeah. hardcore. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and the, the ones that were beaten, beaten up in the streets were the lucky ones. Yeah, go. Another one had shots fired at his house uh-huh. as well. Um, just because there was a, it was the HQ of a publication, right? Yeah, that that that's the thing with having freedom of speech. Mm, yes, and a retired man was sprayed with acid in the face because he was unfortunate enough to have the same surname as a known French SS member in the Second World War. Yeah, no relation whatsoever, you, but he happened you, to have the same name, you, which not is not a real name. You can't change. Uh, you can't choose your family, uh, even if he was related. Well, you don't yeah, know what his political yeah, affiliation. Totally, but he were. wasn't. He wasn't related. It yes. wasn't a rare name. He just wasn't lucky that they spotted the same name. That is savage. That that's ridiculous. Mm. But that was that was was happening in the next few days. Mm. I mean, it must have been a tense time. I would say so. Yes, probably. Mm. Yes, I don't know how far it really spread out of Paris. I don't know if here, for example, people would have been much concerned about it, but certainly in Paris it made a lot of noise. Mm. Until the end of the year, the 
police concentrates instead for effort on far-right groups, because that's where people were looking. Until the author of the anonymous phone call, remember, is finally found. And it was a guy called Jean-Yves Pelé, who was a member of the far-right group, mm -hmm. who thought clever to try to implicate the group in the bombing. Even though the group no longer existed and had nothing to do with him anymore, he later admitted that, admitted that in fact he was a member of a Jewish group who had infiltrated the far-right group and was trying to get it blamed for the bombing. Is this a black Klansman uh, scenario going on? Kind of is, is. It? Mm. yes, it, it is. Okay, if you've not seen Black Klansman, uh, Watch it. Well, I would highly recommend watching it. It's uh, yeah. it's an eye-opening film. But yeah, this is when a black journalist um, try. He basically uh, becomes really friendly and chummy with the guy who ran the KKK in the sixties. And um, we need to say he was a black dude. I, I, I thought I did. Oh, I, I, I didn't. Anyway, right. yeah, he was a black man. Yeah, he was. He was a I black. Just, he was a black guy. That made the situation yes. impossible. So I mean, he was having this conversation on the phone and built up a you know a relationship with uh, Duke, the guy that that ran the clan, and then of course he sent in a a substitute white dude in his place for when they were finally meeting. But anyway, yes, uh, we digress. Yes. Um, the far right trail comes back several times over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. There's one that refuses to go away. It's a Spanish fascist trail because remember Franco is in uh, was just out yeah, yeah. in Spain, so yeah, did, there was yeah. still a lot of fascist activity in uh, in Spain because yeah. Franco died in seventy five, I think, or seventy six. But it never got anywhere. It's just that people suddenly reconnected things and thought, oh, that must be that. And they looked into it and nothing happened. And they did that several times. So it just refused to go, but it never went anywhere. And so basically, lots of straws were being clutched at, at that point. Yeah. One of the police commissioners in charge at the time wrote a book later, and he said that the newly elected socialist government, so we're talking 1981, yeah. was pushing the investigation that way. They were asking, especially the home minister at the time, called Gaston de Fer was pushing and putting a lot of pressure on the police to investigate far-right groups. Well, yeah, I mean, if it's a left-wing government, yeah, yeah they're, they're more than happy to push it towards yes. the right. That was based on absolutely nothing. It's yes. just what they wanted the outcome to be. But yeah. in reality, there was nothing. There was no reason to look there. All right. Because they had solved the, the phone call thing, and nobody else had, had said that they had done it. Mm. So they had no reason to look at far-right groups. Yeah. But anyway, the government was pushing it and therefore yeah. the police had to do it and they just wasted a lot of mm. time doing that. It was a synagogue, therefore. It was a hate crime, therefore. Yes. It was extreme right groups. Yes. That was basically the, what they were basing it on. Yes. Mm -hmm. So over time, they put a lot of members of far-right groups on phone tap. Mm. And after months and months nothing. and months of recording and listening, they just got absolutely nothing. Thought a giant waste of time yeah. and resources. Yeah. So that was just a red herring, complete mm. red herring. In November 1980, the German secret services gave the French police a very important clue. They say that the group that planted the bomb had five members and then they left the country shortly after the bombing. And they, w they went to Beirut. Lebanon. They also provide information on the identity of two of them. From that, the police creates a description of the person that planted the bomb. It's a man with a moustache, uh, Arab, Arabic looking, about 1 meter 70 tall. I'm sure there's not many, you know, Arabic men who have moustaches. Yes. I can't think of an Arabic man who doesn't have a yes. moustache. He had a Jordanian passport. Right. And during a short Stopover in Cyprus. He got hold of a fake passport in the name of Alexander Panadriou. Right. Greek. Yeah. Which he used to buy the motorbike that carried the explosives. Oh, right. So this is actually proper information. It's, it's proper information from the German Secret Service. And I was going yeah. to say, it's come from outside the country. Yes. It's not even the French finding this out. Yeah. In the meantime, the police... That would have been West Germany at the time. Yes, it would have been West Germany, yes. In the meantime, the police had traced the motorbike to a shop in Paris, and the owner remembered the man who bought it. He gave the police the name, Alexander Panadriou. Mm. We've heard that name just yeah. a minute ago. Mm -hmm. 
and a precise description of what he looked like. He said he was about about 25 years old, meter seven, meter 65 to a meter 68, mm -hmm. speaking French with a foreign accent, and with a thin moustache, blonde hair with darker strands, rectangular gla glasses, and a beige jacket. That's very specific. Yeah. From that, they made a photo fit, which was circulated. Mm -hmm. And it happens that on the 8th of October 1981, the Italian police had stopped a group of Palestinians coming from Beirut, again, and had transmitted a copy of one of the passports used to the French services. One of them looked a lot like the description of the motorbike guy. Mm -hmm. That allowed the French police to trace back that identity to Hassan Diab. Right. To link Diab to his fake identity, the police also had writing samples from the hotel where he stayed mm -hmm. and a car rental form because he had rented a car. And that pretty much proved that the guy who was using the passport called Alexander Panadriou was Hassan Diab. Yeah. And it's just such a shame it wasn't today because we just look up CCTV and then yes. then you could ascertain whether it was the same guy or not. Yes. But yes, it was pre, pre but, CCTV. But they could trace the identities yes. together and therefore they knew who it they were him. looking for. So we, we, we now know the real guy who yes. bought the bike. And it matches the description from the motorbike shop. Yep. And also it matches, matches the description given by a prostitute who he had, he had uh, met, I guess. Right, <laughs> met. Uh, spent one night with, okay, uh, including the fact that he was circumcised, because circumcised, that's which was true, and that's what the post said. <laughs> yeah, that's um, if if anybody's listening from the states, um, circumcision is not terribly common in in Europe. I know no. it's common in the U U.S., but it's not that common in Europe outside no. uh, Jewish yes. uh, uh, faith. Yeah, I think one one thing that uh, that first strikes me is. This guy sounds like a very, very unusual neo-Nazi. Uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> he does. So it kind of yes. like would indicate that the French government might have been barking up the wrong yes. tree. Yes, oh, totally, yes. Mm. But at that yes. point, they knew. Of course, of course they do. And being flippant. Yeah, so we're talking, we're still in 1981, roughly. And after right. that, nothing happens for quite a long time. Well, yes, I mean, if we're talking about it was a couple of weeks ago that it was in the news. Yeah. In 1999... The German secret services, again, send the French secret services documents that were seized in the archive of the PFLP-SO group. Now, that's easy for you to say. Yes. Um, what does it mean? I think it means something Palestinian Front for the Liberation of Palestine secret organization. Why I do I have um, Life of Brian in my head? Oh, I, to I totally had it as well. Yeah. <laughs> But yes, um, they somehow managed to get their hands on some of their documents, right. and some of them were relevant, they thought. So they sent so, them to so, the French So this services. is kind of like almost the guts of 20 years later, we're talking. Short of a couple of years, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. These documents came from the East, the ex East German services. So that's why they had never surfaced before. Ah, right, okay. Because until the they reunification the in current. 1990, yes. the West didn't have access to those documents, and yeah. it took years to mm -hmm. go through the archives of the Stasi. Yeah. And eventually got right. they got to those documents mm -hmm. and thought, oh, that's useful and that's interesting. Yeah. So they forwarded them to the French services. Mm -hmm. Stasi's the uh, East German secret police, just for yes. just in case anyone doesn't know. Yes. So these documents describe a woman that the East German services thought had gone on the recce for the terrorist group. She had been followed all the way through Yugoslavia and East Germany. Mm -hmm. by the East German services because right. of course you had more people who keep an eye on other people in East Germany than people yes. doing actually work yes I mean so, it was quite it was a totally different regime from, uh, from oh, it, the it was yeah totally it was totally yeah. a police regime and mm -hmm. they had so many people working for them so oh, yes. they could keep track of anything hey, when you don't have to pay your labour that much then yeah you can yeah. afford to have big uh, staff yeah so for some reason they decided to keep an eye on her and they mm -hmm. followed her and she therefore appeared in the archives right and that group was linked to Hassan Jab. That right. name came came up again. Okay. He also used other identities like Joseph Matthias. Um, he was, according to these Germans, the head of a terrorist cell. Right. Which was part of the uh, PFLPSO. Uh huh. Who were traveling around about the uh, behind the Iron Curtain. Yeah. 
the passport, the app's passport, yeah. had previously been found in the possession of Selim Abu Salem's nephew. Right. Selim Abu Salem was the head of the PFLPSO group. Right. So they don't burn their pa- their identities. They seem quick. to swap passports somehow. Yeah. Um, I don't it's know how, how, why. Um, yeah, so it's not like the movies, is it? Yeah. That passport, once it was seized, showed that Diab entered France on the 20th of September 1980, mm-hmm. a few days earlier, yeah. after before the bombing, and left on the 7th of October. But he didn't hang later. around a lot then. But if you come to put a bomb, you don't no. stay around, so mm, no. Yeah. He didn't stay to take in the sights and uh, pick up some wine. Yes. <laughs> So at that point, an international international search starts because they have no idea where he is. Mm. The Israeli, Lebanese, American, Canadian, German and French services look for him. Wow. And the first clue comes from an in, the Interpol office in Washington that transmits the first traces they have of Diab. He entered the US on the 27th of August 1987 with Naiwa C. I don't have her surname. She, it wasn't in the newspaper. His okay. wife. Okay. They had got married in Cyprus earlier, um, a week earlier, roughly. Uh-huh. And they took residence in Syracuse, where Diab continues his studies. It's kind of funny. I mean, he disappeared for a large chunk of the 80s. He would, yeah, he probably didn't want to make any waves. No. Um, especially if he had any clue yeah. that his name was floating around the Secret Services. So in that yeah. case, you... They obviously came from Lebanon. And, it and he'd probably it just go to stayed Lebanon. in Lebanon with his head down. Exactly. Yeah. And nobody will find you over there. Because mm. remember, the Lebanese war started in 1980 and ended in 1989, as far as I remember. Okay, so that's the... So that would have been that very easy to hide over yes. there because it was complete chaos. Oh, yes. Oh. So, so, yes, that's probably what he did. Mm-hmm. In 2007, so we're talking now a bunch of years later, eight years later, as the French head of anti-terrorism judge is away on an election campaign, so he decided to become an MP, he gave control of the inquiry, which was still open, to one of his colleagues, Marc Trevidic, who was born in Bordeaux, by the way. I see. And he nearly straight away issues an international arrest warrant that he sends to the US against the guy called Hassan Diab. Mm-hmm because he was known to have lived in the US, in Syracuse, and possibly in Canada, but that was a bit fuzzy. He obviously likes his weather cold. I think he likes his weather far from Europe. <laughs> well, yes, yes, uh, there is that, but I mean, he could have gone to Arizona or something. That's true. Or New Mexico, but Syracuse yes. would be pretty chilly, and if you're yeah. going into, uh, I mean, that's almost as good as Canada, so. Yeah. Once again, Diab's writing is compared by the French Secret Services, mm-hmm using the U.S. and Canadian paperwork he filled to move around, because, of course, he's not allowed to move freely around around the U.S. Mm -hmm. And also his um, university university applications, because he was at the university in Syracuse, so he had to apply for it and therefore fill forms and stuff, so he had more writing He was there on a student visa. He was, yes. Mm -hmm. One expert says that the link is likely. Another says that it has to be the same person. Right. And therefore, the French government asked for a third expertise, and he's at, the expert is asked to confirm, and she says that she thinks it's the, it's the same person. So at that point, they have a whole bunch of links between the guy they're looking for in the US, the bombing, the false passport, and the Lebanese group. Right. So Diab is arrested in Gatineau in Quebec. On the 13th of November, 2008. It was Quebec. Yeah. uh, Yes, the government in Quebec would probably have been more willing to Mm. to do something than if it had been Ottawa or something. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So he's arrested there. But there is kind of a problem because at that point, he's a sociology professor at the University of Ottawa. So he's done well then. Seems to have done well, yes. And... He has the Canadian Lebanese nationality, the dual nationality. Ah. So that causes problems, of course, because the Canadians are not too keen to, uh, no. to extradite their own citizens. Yeah, oh dear. So that complicates things. Although he's the main suspect, he denies that it's him. Mm-hmm. And he's freed on bail with electro- electronic tagging, so they can keep an eye on him just in case. Right. 
because he appeals the extradition. Mm-hmm. He argues that he's just a victim of a homonym. So there's another Hassan Diab somewhere on the planet. It's not him that bombed it. He just happens to have the same name. That's his argument. He just happens to be exactly like the... They just happen to have the yes. same name, look the same. Yes, but it's not him. But it's not him, okay. He says that at the time of the bombing, he was in Beirut in the middle of exams. Because right. he was a student. His family and friends confirm, which, of course, is contradicted by his passport, because his passport says he was in France at the time of the bombing. You know the passport that was collected by the Germans? Yeah. So... And that point that kind of plays against him. Also, the extradition treaty between France and Canada is not reciprocal, so it can it creates more more issues. But eventually, the Canadian courts allow the extradition in June 2011. So it takes nearly three years. Right, we're still not. We're still over a decade away, though. Yes, the Canadian Justice Minister signs the extradition order on the 4th of April 2012, so again another year, mm-hmm. he appeals again. Of course he does. But the Supreme Court refuses his appeal on the, on the 12th of November 2012. He arrives in France on the 15th of November 2012, and he's arrested as he comes out of the plane, obviously. He's charged with multiple murders, attempted murders, destruction of property with an explosive substance as part, in, as part of an organized group. Mm-hmm. That's what he's charged with. Finally, the trial can start. We're talking nearly 20 years, no, 30 years, yes, after the bombing. Mm -hmm. The first WTF moment is that when he's he's taken out of prison and put on electronic monitoring on the 17th of May 2016. Because there is a testimony that comes in that casts doubts on his participation to the bombing. Apparently, one of his close acquaintances gave him an alibi for the period leading to the bombing. So he's freed at that point to investigate that testimony. They let him out? That doesn't sound like... They, sound they let him out, no, but they go and get him again, and he goes back to prison on the 24th of May. Right. The appeal court said, no, you go back to prison. Yes. New WTF moment, the instructing judge in charge decided on the 27th of October 2016... So, barely six months later, yeah. mm-hmm. to release him and put him on house arrest with electric, electronic, electronic tagging again. Again, the prosecuting judge appeals, and on the 4th of November, the court decides that he needs to go back to prison, so he goes back to prison for six months. It's beginning to feel like the hokey cokey at the moment. Yes. He comes in, out, in, out. Pretty much. Mm-hmm. On the 24th of April 2017, that's the next year, he's freed again. Oh my God. Amnesty International possibly um, put some pressure on the various the governments because they say a lot of the evidence was collected under torture and therefore wouldn't be acceptable in court. <laughs> yes. And that could have been true. So mm-hmm. that's why they release him again. Right. And f- f- to, uh, to investigate it mm-hmm. because you can't keep someone in prison for no reason. No. In total, he's in and out of prison eight times. And it's ordered by four different judges over time. It's amazing. So it is the hokey cookie. It goes in, out, in, out, in, out, eight times of prison. That's ridiculous. Yes. And that's why it takes so long. And that's why essentially nothing happens between 2012 and now. Because he was just going in and out of prison for all these years. Almost 11 years. I mean, it's shocking. Finally, on the 28th of July 2017, all parties are notified of the end of the inquiries. So at that point, the judges are happy they have finished their investigation. They have enough. Mm -hmm. On the 12th of January 2018, we're talking six months later, the tribunal order a dismissal for lack of proof against him. He's freed again. Oh my God. (laughs) Again, the prosecution appeals. Mm. On the 27th of January 2021, the process starts again. At that point, we're 40 years after the bombing. Yeah. Again, the courts have more tests done, more experts t- testifying, more evidence. They essentially start from scratch, mm-hmm. build another case, mm-hmm. and attack him again in court. Right. And this time, the courts accept that there's probably enough evidence, so he's not freed again. He's kept in prison. For now. Yes. 
And finally, the trial starts on the 3rd of April, 2023. Right. So he's in prison for a year and a half or so, until, awaiting trial. Until it starts. Yeah. At that point, he's not there because he's 69. He's old. 69 isn't that old, but okay. It's, it's old. It's old for being in prison again, so he had been released again. Right. So he's now in Canada again. Because, of course, he's not going to stay in Europe. So Yeah, when they're saying house arrest, I'm presuming that he's going back to Canada, is he? Yeah, he's in Canada. And therefore, he's tried in absentia because right. he's not there. So he was in prison awaiting trial. And at some point, somebody decided he's too old to be held in prison for no good reason. They let him out. So what was that? Ninth time? Tenth time? I've yeah, lost I've track lost of how many count. times he was freed. So I mean, once basically, again, the, the the prison must have had a revolving door for him. Pretty much, <laughs> yes. She had a special card. Yes. But on the 21st of April, 2023, mm-hmm. the court finds him guilty and sentences him to prison for life. Of course, now, as he's in Canada, they have to start his tradition processes again to get him back to France. That hasn't been done yet. So he's still not in prison, but he has he's a... still not in prison. He he's in tag. Canada. He's he has found guilty. Does he have a tag? I don't know. I don't know if he's under house arrest in Canada. Because he was freed as... We, have no, we, we don't have anything on you yet, because yeah, he was awaiting trial. But it just seems crazy that they, they tried him, you know, when he wasn't there. When, you well, know, you're allowed to. You're allowed to try people yeah, if they're not but, there. Why did they not bring him back? Well, that's the thing. I, I don't know. I, it, obviously, his age was a problem to some people. And they decided you can't keep a 69-year-old in prison when he hasn't been sentenced yet. So they let him out. Yeah, I mean, he's, you know, innocent until proven guilty. Exactly. And he had yeah. been in prison on and in and out uh, for the last 10 years or so. <laughs> so at some point, somebody, and I don't know who it is because it wasn't in the, in the newspapers, but somebody must have decided, okay, we have to let him out. And okay. he just legged it, essentially, to Canada mm. again. Because they couldn't hold him. No. So that's about it. That's where we are in the moment. He's found guilty, sentenced to life in prison, but in Canada. So he needs to be brought back in in France. There's a controversy that happened just after the bombings. The prime minister at the time, Raymond Barr, who was quite liked at the time, actually. He was very very moderate, um, very intelligent. Mm -hmm. He was working hard. But he said on the news when he was being interviewed just after the bombing on the, um, the evening news on that day, that the bomb was intended for the Jewish people attending the synagogue. So far, so good. Right. But the bomb struck innocent French citizens. And that didn't go down well at no. all. You, you, you can't, you don't get to well, kind of like prioritize. Life is, you know, a, a person's life yeah, is just as valuable as the next all person's the life. the Jewish people in the synagogue were French as well. Okay, yeah, that's true. You can be, yes, you can be French and Jewish And Jewish, as well, exactly. Yeah. So what she said implies that if you're Jewish, you're not French. God. And that didn't go down well. It probably played a role in the next elections, which were a few months later. Mm. And until he died in 2007, he always denied that that's what he meant, that his words were misinterpreted. Oh, sure. Well, he would say that, wouldn't he? I'm not racist. Yeah, but it went down in history as something really, really, really bad the Prime Minister said. Oh, yeah. Well, things Prime Minister shouldn't say 101. Pretty much, yes. I'm sure he could probably say that some of his best friends were Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he could, yeah, I don't know. I'm not anti-Semitic. Some of my best yes. friends are Jewish. Anyway, I think this is kind of like an ongoing case and... I guess out of respect for the the four people who lost their lives, uh, I think me saying something flippant and flippant at the end of it, this doesn't doesn't really feel right. So, all I can say is join us in the next episode.